Um, and we're all set to begin. Okay, well, um, welcome everyone to um, this follow-up session hands-on. Um, for those of you who were part of the previous session in the plenary, I'm going to dive deeper into the ideas that I shared with you. Those were kind of helicopter broader scope ideas. And now I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper, but we don't have a lot of time. I realize <laughs> that this session is much shorter than I thought. And I was so eager to share a lot of ideas and strategies. So I have to cut short my presentation, but please reach out after um, I will continue, we'd love to continue the conversation. So we have about 23 uh, participants, folks joining, and I would like to, okay, so let me start. The, the idea is to divide this present, this time together into three areas. Um, one, I'm going to just very briefly go into follow up on the concept of um, this um, engagement process I'm also going to keep an eye on the chat, but when I share the screen, I can't see it, but I'm, I'm used to teaching that way. Okay, um, so let me dive a little bit on a couple of ideas on thinking about engagement from a dynamic, complex, in local environments. Very briefly, because I, I, I don't want to repeat from the plenary second, um, I'm going to provide some ideas and some areas for you to consider in terms of concrete approaches and strategies for engagement, but I would love to hear from you as well. We have expertise, so much expertise, and I truly believe in um, communities of learning. So I can lead the discussion, but I'm also, please feel free to add in the chat, or you can raise your hand, or, or um, I think raising your hand will be the best way each zoom system is a little bit different but um you should have you should be able to raise your hand yes yeah, so i can see you because right now i can see everyone okay and the last part i want to share a concrete example on a picori funded project from beginning to end just highlighting in concrete how did we do it how do we engage a pragmatic trial um, and how do we engage Latinx uh, community members into our pragmatic randomized control trial for three years uh, and a PCORI funded um, study. Okay, so let me get started with just a few questions. I wanna use the polls, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I'm gonna ask for you to add in the chat and let's start with the first question. Have you been part of a pragmatic trial? Yes or no? Do you mind entering in the chat if you have or not? Or you're not sure? Vanessa said no. Maybe you were part of a trial, but it was never discussed. What's the difference with a pragmatic trial? Holly, Venice, thank you. Margaret, nope. Okay, okay, well, good. Dana or Dana say yes. So you can help me with, with this presentation, Rachel. So we have variety in the group. Luis, say no. Okay. Yes, Katie. That gives me an idea. Thank you. Second question, Andrea says no. How do you consider yourself in terms of your experience engaging diverse groups? Do you consider yourself to be, oh, Jesse, I don't know. Good question. Yes, I love it. Um, and that is so important that we are very explicit on the type of trial that we are engaging ourselves. It's a pragmatic trial where we are trying to mimic as much as we can the real conditions. And that has implications for engagement, even budgeting and procedures versus a more controlled environment. Second question, you guys are ahead of me, perfect. We have some beginners, intermediates. I don't know who will be the advanced experience, but having an under your belt more than let's say four years, five years of you engaging, reaching out, that will make you an experienced um, researcher engaging different communities in terms of efforts. Okay. Just mentioned intermediate from a community organizing background. Oh, good point. So that's a similar pathway where I started. So since passion, even before I came to this country from Colombia, um, I started in very heavy community grassroots uh, NGOs, organizations, uh, leadership within the community. I consider that to be part of my experience, but then I wanted to get more training uh, when I moved to this country a long time ago. So I 
did my master's degree and I got fascinated by the research, um, especially in looking for answers, questions and answers in our healthcare system and policy. So you're right, you may have experience with communities themselves, but not on research. There's a lot of overlap, but also some differences, but it's which experience that you can bring and really highlight. Number three, that should be one, two, and three. Which group of a stakeholders, especially we consider the seven P uh, groups of a stakeholders, do you feel is represented the least in your work? Which group you're always thinking or wondering, oh, we need more representation from a specific group? Any group? Katie or Kathy, I'm sorry, mentioned uh, minority patients. I agree, yes. Patients, policymakers, yes. Funders, so true, Margaret, thank you. Patients, families, excellent. Oh, I haven't thought much about patients, families. Thank you, yes. Elders, thank you, uh, Rachel. Okay. So as you can see, even um, with our best efforts, these groups are different. Each group of stakeholders are different and we might be better at engaging some, let's say providers or members of the community where we belong to than others. But definitely you have mentioned three key groups where we do struggle, policymakers, I'm gonna add funders to those, um, as well as minority groups. And some of you included patients, families, and then elderly, grandparents who serve as caregivers of um, child patients if you're in prison pediatric care. Thank you. Thank you for your active participation in the chat. Okay, so I really wanted to, um, structure our time together as thinking on um, in a pragmatic tri trial. There are several areas, so many areas to keep in mind To So I felt like we have to juggle um, to keep our partners engaged and do a meaningful participation. So that meaningful concept comes from many areas, but including the co-creation literature in terms of us promoting a process where each of us have see something, see some benefit or reciprocity, but also where each of our um, participation is meaningful. Even if I'm a grandmother, I'm 60, if I'm a Latina in the community, if I'm a CEO, CEO um, that each of us see some meaningful participation and relationships in the study process. Okay, so I wanted to briefly touch on this concept. I was talking to my colleague, Kathleen Wilkins, we're working on a project and I love that you mentioned collaborations are messy. And I wanted to highlight that because so often we look at nice models that are linear and they look so clean, but collaborations are messy. That's one way of seeing it. Why do you think collaborations, engagement, engagement with different stakeholders is messy? What is messy for you? What is the, the the challenging part, the messy part, messy not in a negative way at all. But what becomes challenging? If you could add in the chat for us, for you, what, what would you say is messy? Why collaborations and partnerships are kind of messy? They're kind of uncertain, difficult to grasp. We have groups that we really need to do a better job at engaging. Any thoughts about collaborations being messy? Margaret, thank you. They have different priorities. Excellent, yes. So they, we see our st stakeholders pulling in different directions and we're right in the middle. Diverse perspectives, that takes more time. Emily, excellent, thank you. For example, in IMH project, we are on, a, or an NIH project, we are on a timeline more often, it's tight, yes. And this buying and learning from each other takes time. Power dynamics, different communities. Thank you, Mary and Rachel that you, you all have hit on the key points on what makes these collaborations kind of messy. We speak different languages. I would say literally and yes, from different backgrounds and expertise. Levels of trust, I love it, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna keep going in the interest of time. Thank you for, for your sharing your expertise with us. Okay, let me share a few, again, a few additional points Thank you, Jess, some power differentials within groups. 
yes, engagement within dynamic context, and just a few other ideas on my take. Um, contexts are kind of messy, especially if you are interested or working with under-resourced community-based settings. I work with federally qualified health centers, and they often experience all of these challenges that make our collaboration so messy, challenging. These are part of the identifying the challenges for successful implementations. But we know we talk about that during the plenary. Um, the question came up, what do we do with turnover? It's a major problem in healthcare, but also in human services, talking about child protective services, turnover in terms of case workers. But it's, it's a problem with the system themselves. We see the same. It is reflected in research. Our champions leave, our partners leave, the director leaves, and you have to start all over again with buying, learning from each other. There are issues with workflow. Every time we do a pragmatic trial, we are asking our partners who are already in a very stretch, uh, um, they're very stretched, there's burnout to add something to their workflow. But quite often we don't look at that aspect of their work in terms of implementation strategies. How will this new program impact your workflow? And ask those questions to our different stakeholders, um, to front desk, scheduler, uh, supervisors, managers, even patients if we can. So please consider workflow because they, they pose a major challenge and it's a priority for healthcare systems. How is this new screening intervention group-based pro, uh, program is going to impact or strain even more our workflow? There are issues with patients and issues by that, I mean, many of these systems serve patients, what it has been called in the literature with complex needs. And that means patients that they, they don't have one need, they have multiple co-occurring physical, behavioral health and social needs. So they require a lot of more time and the coordination of care coordination for multiple primary care and specialty care. Our healthcare system is complex in the United States. That is not secret. Funding fluctuates, especially during and after COVID for our systems, even funding for researchers. Um, so these are some of the challenges I have faced firsthand. And I'm sure many of you or all of you have faced in terms of engaging how these challenges can make this process kind of messy. So let's, let's keep moving to, okay, what are the tools? How do we approach engagement, knowing that it can get a little, a little bit messy and thinking in terms of dynamic context. There are many models for engagement. One of those are coming from the community-based participatory research. This is one of the models that I like, but again, there are many. I'm just um, presenting this to you for consideration, um, including the citation. I'm not going to go over each of these aspects, but think of each box as an area that you need to really discuss and explore with your stakeholders. And seeing it this way in a logic model and framework it really can facilitate the structure of your process. What I want to highlight here, my point is this. So notice those feedback loops. Notice those arrows going on every direction, going right and then left. That is also a reflection of how dynamic these, these environments are, this process of engaging others is. And it becomes, poses a challenge when we're trying to evaluate how do we deal with engagement if each box impacts the next, but also the outcomes can impact the context and our own partnership. The intervention itself can actually impact our partnership. So just wanted to um, mention that um, even in, you can find the frameworks uh, reflect the complexity of the dynamic environments that we, um, well, that we face. So again, I am um, proposing a context dependent engage engagement, but I wanted to provide a little more detail. Okay, if we buy into this, what do we do with this? Um, I already explained it during the plenary, if you were not um, attending, I started looking at the different groups, and I think that was a question in the, during the plenary. What are the groups? Here is a suggestion of evidence-based taxonomies um, created by Konkanon and colleagues in terms of think of policymakers, researchers, funders, product makers or program developers, for example, payers, purchasers, providers, and consumers. These are some of the groups we may involve in an ongoing basis, but 
the, the red arrow here is reflecting the concept that the groups at the bottom, in my view, are really more reliant and dependent on changes in their local environment, day-to-day -day activities of their job, of their availability of work, caregiving uh, possibilities, uh, transportation, and that the groups at the top have, in a way, less reliance on day-to-day -day activities and experiences in their neighborhoods and communities because they are tasked with seeing kind of being the helicopter view, seeing it at the terms of policy at the state level, uh, nationwide, county level. So if we buy into that, it's only logical to, for us to approach engagement with tailoring, customizing the way we engage with these different groups. For example, for groups at the bottom, um, you may first, in, during engagement, um, just explore and really um, develop that sense of wonder. Um, get to know the communities, if you can, a little bit more by attending a uh, um, county association where a group of clinics, federally qualified health center clinics meet once a month. Can you, can, you can ask to be invited and just sit there, but if you can engage them first, getting to know them and for them to know that you are there and you're interested, authenticity, as my colleague Dr. Jones mentioned, that you're truly, honestly interested on what they do and the well-being of their systems, but also patients can go a long way. For policymakers, they might not have the time for you to sit there, but you can expand and strengthen their networks, the networks from the top down. So that could be another emphasis that is more tailoring. For policymakers, you offer additional networks with community groups, grassroots organizations to get them connected, especially during implementation and dissemination of the study results or their policy. I know we talk about these, but I just wanted to um, ask again, what makes it more challenging to engage those groups, for example, that you all mentioned that we struggle, I completely agree, minority groups, um, elderly, policymakers, what makes the environment difficult for us to do that? If you can add any thoughts, free association is good, is, is welcome. Any thoughts on this question on the chat? What about the context? What about the environment makes it challenging for us to really be more successful in engaging this whole array of um, partners here, for example, from the 7P model? Any ideas, any reactions to this question? If not, that is perfectly fine, we'll keep moving. Okay, that is perfectly fine. Let's keep moving on. Let me keep going in terms of, okay, let's get to the meat of it in terms of time. So let me share a few strategies, areas for you to consider. Please keep adding on the chat. Um, I'm not the, the only one with all the answers, but um, let's keep going. We can go back to this question. So um, in terms of concrete activities, hands-on, how do we juggle all these different groups some priorities and values? Um, as I mentioned early on for a question, how do, how do you set up the groups? Who is involved at the table? I always encourage interviews with leaders um, to uh, grow the groups upwards. So you first identify one or two leaders and you start asking them a kind of a snowballing effect. You start growing your groups of stakeholders but always including first their feedback and their inclusion. It's kind of a symbolic way, symbols and, and rituals are so important for many communities. Then developing these work group meetings, you can give it a different name, but many communities are so tired of advisory boards. Um, so I've been calling them work group meetings. You can choose another word because it, it reflects like hands-on, roll up our sleeves, we're gonna work on something. But it could be an ongoing group that discuss the broader area. For example, I work on trauma-informed care. California has a new policy. So in 2019, we started a work group just to discuss trauma-informed care for a particular FQAC system. No plans, but I sat at the table and I, pro I provided them with um, evidence, what we know in this area. I wrote a few articles in the newsletter from the scientific perspective, but that can go a long way in terms of engaging initially for planning, and for development of ideas and even grant proposals. 
there is, there is a, a group of strategies called discrete, discrete choice experiments, DCE, that can help you that are validated, evidence-based, and it can help you prioritize and narrow options. Because let's say you have different stakeholder groups. If you go with the majority rules, you may leave some minority values, opinions, and needs out. So how do you juggle different opinions and values? Someone asked that question and priorities. Well, DCE are validated methods. They borrow from health economics and it can, it can really provide tools for your research. Um, you can actually um, Google additional information on, on projects and publications on DCE. I included also in the handout a few resources. Consensus conference or citizen jury. I have used this a, a few years, but it's a new approach, comes from public relationships, management, public works. And it's, it's a very interesting process for you to gain um, a view from your stakeholders, usually used on new guidelines, such as let's say, um, colorectal cancer screening, or mammograms, decreasing the age, or the use of technology. But the whole point is that you bring a group of experts who present to your stakeholders, it could be a community advisory group or community-based group, the pros and cons of whatever you're trying to achieve, let's say new guidelines, and they kind of cross-examine the, the recommendations from the expert group, they allow, you allow them time for them to deliberate, and they provide a report, doesn't have to be written, but they provide their own view on the pros and cons of using these type of guidelines or using technology. But that's another approach is called citizens jury approach. It can be very helpful. Another approach is to carve out time for the different phases of the study. It sounds so straightforward, but carving out time really for each phase can really set the, set the, set the stage and the time to flush out the content of what do we need to do, who, when, and how at each phase and keep a balance between professionals and patients or consumers so they don't overpower um, the ladder. I use preparatory and the briefing groups, for example, with patients, with moms, caregivers, when I, where I ask them, if you wanna join the whole group, let's prep together. So let's meet before, and then we're gonna debrief after. Or I ask them, or you prefer to meet separately. These prep and debriefing meetings have been so helpful and they value that. They will give you feedback immediately after the meeting, if possible, or a few days, if things didn't work out for them. And I got the feedback. I didn't feel, I couldn't talk. You have too many professionals. Um, we, I sat at the back, I couldn't hear, things like that. But it was immediate, it was almost, it was fresh with these brief and debriefing um, um, meetings. We have implemented a couple of DCE experiments, discrete choice, and very briefly, I'm gonna share a little bit um, what, me, what it means. Um, they are all based on health economics theory, and the idea is that you have priorities, and the fourth choice experiment is the one on the right with the stars. We did it with a diverse group, patients all the way to directors, uh, upper administration, um, and we, set up different statements, priorities after discussions. This was for the development of a tool to increase capacity of um, behavioral health community-based clinics to engage in research. So they, a lot of the conversations um, based on those, these four statements emerge in terms of priorities. This is just an example. You can give actually stickers in person or doing online where you ask each of the participants to place stickers and they need to give more stickers to their top priority. So they start playing with the number. You can offer four or even three or, or five or fewer, but for user-friendly, that's my priority. I need to give at least two of those stars. That means the others are only gonna get one, but it's, it, it's just a visual way to, for the main priority to emerge, where you can do best, best and worst case scenario. Is it the tool being user-friendly uh, will that be the best option for you or the worst option if you have to pick one or the two? It just forces participants to pick base case scenario or worse or most likely to less likely for them to be even appealing, for that option to be appealing with that, for them. A couple of other strategies um, that um, I wanted to address. Um, the first one has to do with health equity. 
Um, if make sure your team reflects the community we care about, you care about, and not only that, but make sure that those um, research team members are also kind of at, at the top in terms of leading groups, in terms of um, decision making. Um, so your partners, let's say patients or community, especially underrepresented communities can see representation, but not only on um, recruitment, for example. And I, I speak from experience where I have been in the past. At the beginning of my career, I was invited mostly to take care of recruitment. Um, so that is something for the PCORI project that I mentioned, if we get to it, um, three Latinas with a PhD, the three of us, I was the lead person of the mentor parent group, but the two, my two colleagues, Gabriela Stein and Linda, um, were part of the process. And the PI kind of stepped um, aside in a way and allow us to lead this mentor group. But of course, she was also part of the feedback loop process. Um, so those are key strategies that have been extremely helpful um, in my work. Discuss conflict, turnover, loss of interest availability. Don't run away from it. I did for years and it was just so messy when it happened. So now I bring them from day one. You don't have to bring them all at the same time, but I constantly bring them up and you can see that my partners, I can see my partners have been a little bit uncomfortable, but after a while we start just carving out little by little to what, what if. And then when things happen, we at least have some ideas and it has been part of the engagement process. So it's not a surprise. And you will be surprised how many times teams don't engage in these conversations from the beginning because they don't want to ruin the mood or, or make things in a negative way. I have found the opposite when I do it early on. Consider task shifting in pragmatic trials. Um, one of my um, projects is looking at health activation. We, have, we did the original randomized control trial, comparative effectiveness, where the group facilitators were PhD students being trained by, the, by a faculty member. We are now trying to scale it out to permanent supportive housing, agencies that house adults with lived experiences of homelessness. There is no way that they will be able to implement a health activation program with um, highly skilled workforce in a daily basis for many reasons. Residents might not trust outsiders, but also in terms of budget. So we're proposing, we're writing a proposal that is due soon to um, NIH, where we are doing task shifting, where we are going to identify peer members, peers who have been already in leadership positions, for example, in permanent supportive housings, the floor managers, are residents, individuals that live in subsidized housing, but are expressed or shown some leadership. They can become trained and they can become my coaches. And that's the proposal we are doing. Consider task shifting as much as possible and bringing the key um, experts to support you in that. It's not as easy and just shifting tasks. Um, keep asking when, how, and who do we do these because things change and you might not be aware. And the selection of outcomes is so key. Um, if I get to that, uh, I will give you an example where we actually had to change our outcome, brush to PCORI based on parents' feedback, and things work out just fine, but it was based on their feedback. Budgeting then is an issue. So a few things on budgeting, decide the appropriate recognition to a stakeholder's time, especially if you have um, underrepresented groups or patients or communities in rural areas, for example, you can, and that could be anything. It could be incentives, it could be support for childcare and transportation. If you provide gift cards of cash, the amount is such a sensitive thing. And it's again, because it's, it's, it's very um, symbolic. It's a sensitive thing. I always ask my partners, organizational partners, I could ask end users, but I rely more on my on the organization, on the amount and who should receive incentives. And this is a decision that you have to face. I have to face, I have no answers. In my view, a mom who has expertise on diabetes management should receive $50, $40 incentives, the same as a um, clinical provider MD with a stellar record. You may disagree with, you, with me. I know some of my colleagues may disagree. But some others think that that is, is really not fair that professionals should receive higher amount of incentives versus let's say a mom who is going to be more on an advisory board. I don't have the answers. I have my preference, 
but it, it just depends the difference in amounts. So they're gonna know, they're gonna be aware. Always check with upper and middle management about can I offer incentives to your personnel? It's such a sensitive topic and it's linked to their culture and climate. Some of my colleagues uh, in partners in organizations have said, sure, no problem. Some is a major issue and there are meetings and they discuss. So please don't assume asking advice. Um, and some of your partners might disagree. IRB might say, this is too much for, for patients. You have to lower for clinicians, that is okay. And that's a decision that you have to make. Yeah, Emily is mentioning that your, your university might have some guidelines, but discuss it and explain with your partner. So if I'm a mom, if I'm Latina, and I see that the director is getting $80, if, if any, and I'm getting 20, please explain beforehand because that can create more in, at least perception of inequalities. Again, I have shared my preference. Um, I'm gonna keep going because, running out of time, but just very briefly, um, if you haven't, here's the link. PCORI has a complete, a complete, concrete rubric that you can use for the different phases of research. It's online and it's for free. And it's an engagement rubric that they use for research. Consider also including an implementation framework. I work with Greg Aarons and his wonderful team. Uh, so I'm familiar with the EPIS. But just as a way to think of engagement, okay, who do I need at the table and how when we are just preparing to implement this new program? Who do we need during the exp well, exploration is first, but it just allows us to organize and put the, the, the faces, the process in an organized manner, but thinking that you may get ready and realize we need to add additional folks so you have to go back. During implementation, things didn't work out, so you have to go back and prepare. But implementation frameworks such as CIFR and EPIS, for example, and REAIM are the most usually used. They can be very helpful. I'm gonna leave that there so you review later. I'm almost running out of time. There are usually 10 principles, but I love uh, Minkler because it talks about racism and ethnicity as a principle to consider. You might hear or see more talk about decolonizing research. I just wanted to put that there and a citation so you can become more familiar and get your own thoughts and position on the matter. And I've run out of time to give you a kind of a tour of the project, but I can emphasize this. How do we create the structure that two things for this project? So from all the things that I have talked to you, I just wanted to emphasize two things that we did. Um, and again, I'm happy to discuss more of these offline. I'll show my last slide with my email. So on the left is the fancy, in a way, fancy research design that we submitted to PCORI for researchers. But then I sat with the mentor, our mentor parents and I asked them, what would be the best way for me to convey what we're going to do with this project before, after, and the activities? Um, and I showed them that graph and say, this graph might not be helpful. They say, no, that's not helpful. So they, we actually put together as a group, that was one of the first sessions, how they wanted to see the flowchart uh, of the study. And you can see it's in Spanish. And they came up also with the text inside and the arrows. I put it in a big poster, laminated it, and I carry that thing on every meeting. And that's how we review, because we may have new parents joining and again, if you remember, I said I, we met separately because we met during the weekends with a lot of good food. But that's one strategy is how you present your study makes such a difference. The other um, process that I wanted to highlight, especially you have to divide the group because it's not realistic to have everyone at 9 a.m. is to create, um, I use a lot of the PDCA model, but the whole idea is to create a concrete, explicit, feedback loop, and that's how we did it. So we started with researchers um, allowing parents to go through intervention. That's how we identify the parents. I talk a little bit about that. But then I met with the parents and we came up with two or three things, not many, where they gave us recommendations. And then I took that, I transcribed within a few days. Within a week, I was tasked with bringing that to our weekly research team meetings. And then at the next meeting, I told them what happened, the same two or three things. So they saw the, the alignment. 
And I was very careful of keeping their voices and reporting back. This is what happened, folks. This is what we did. This is some of the, the tools that we use on how do we present. You can see bars, and you can see that some bars are taller than others. Um, that's a perfect statistical approach for um, our parents. And that's it. I run out of time. Uh, but thank you. Uh, I hope some of these strategies are helpful. Um, I will make sure that you have this, this PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to stop sharing. Jess, yes, I'm happy to make them available. Um, I'll talk with Bethany on how you can have them. Um, again, please reach out if you have any questions. Let me put my email in the chat, um, usc.edu. Yes, Katie has mentioned, yes, the slides will be available. Oh, this, do we have time for questions? If we have time, my understanding is that the session closes like now. But if we have time, a few minutes. Um, if not, <laughs> let's say like a couple minutes, I think. Two minutes. Any reactions, questions, concerns? If not, we're good to go. I think we're good to go. Thank you.